go ahead and get started. Um, so this one hopefully won't take as long as the one did yesterday, um, but this is going to be somewhat more of a foreign concept, I would guess. Maybe not. I mean, you, you guys have known about batteries all your lives. You use batteries all the time. Um, since I have become a father of small children, I have gone through so many batteries, I feel like I am destroying the environment single-handedly. Um, but batteries are important, okay? And so this is this is fairly applicable um, and kind of cool, but maybe just slightly complicated. So here we go. All right. So voltaic cells, um, we got to go back to the last chapter that we just talked about, which included the idea of free energy, okay? So we said that free energy is the energy that's available to do work. So it's kind of like the potential energy that a particular system contains and when it reacts, the energy that it releases, that's that free energy, okay? Um, in a spontaneous redox reaction, um, in other words, one that's going to release free energy into the surroundings, we can actually harness that energy, okay? And that's kind of the idea of a battery. So a voltaic or a galvanic cell, um, we're going to be talking about these voltaic cells for the next three or four sets of notes. Actually, we're just going to kind of keep expanding on this idea. So this is the very important introduction to what a voltaic cell is, okay? And you need to know this. Um, on the AP exam, it is likely that at some point they are going to give you a drawing of a voltaic cell and you're going to have to answer some question associated with it, okay? Last year, it was an entire free response question with a voltaic cell at the beginning and they just asked a bunch, a bunch of fairly difficult questions, okay? so. We, we need to kind of know these inside and out. Um, but basically, a voltaic cell is just kind of using a chemical reaction and, and um, causing it to occur in such a way that we get some energy out of it, okay? Which, you know, that's kind of how all of our energy is produced, okay? Um, a lot of our energy is produced because we use combustion reactions, right? We harness the energy of combustion and use it to turn a wheel which turns a generator, which generates electricity, which we can then, you know, use in our houses. So um, a battery is a slightly different way of doing a similar thing where we just harness the energy of a chemical reaction and we use it to, um, to produce some usable energy. All right, so here's an example. Um, we have seen many of these kinds of examples in this class. We actually talked about one yesterday when we were doing the AP packet or I talked about a couple, actually. Um, but the main one that you guys are familiar with from last year is the one where we dip the copper wire into the silver nitrate, right? And then you end up with some uh, silver uh, crystallizing or plating out on that copper wire, and then the solution turns blue because the copper ions are now going into the solution, okay? Very similar thing happens when you have zinc and, uh, and copper 2 plus. So if you put a zinc strip into a solution of you know, copper nitrate, copper chloride, doesn't really matter what it is, as long as it has Cu2 plus ions in it. Um, and what you're going to eventually see is the copper starts to solidify on the outside of the zinc, and then the zinc goes into the solution, and the solution turns clear eventually, okay? So the reaction that's happening here, um, we've got zinc solid that's being added to copper 2 plus, and I'm just going to write the net ionic here because we're not even specifying what else is in the solution. It doesn't matter. Okay, it could be nitrate, could be chloride, um, could be something else. Uh, it could be sulfate. I guess it just it really doesn't matter. Okay, we're just concerned with the copper two plus ions. So what's going to happen here is the zinc is going to go into the solution, and the solid copper is going to plate out. Okay. So. Again, this is the kind of question that you will get a lot on number four on the free response, um, this type of reaction. And then they might even ask you the second part, what, what do you observe during this reaction, okay? So, and I just said the two things, that, the main two things that we would observe here. One is that the copper um, plates out on the zinc. I guess you could say precipitates. I'm not sure that that's the best term to use here. Plate, plates out just means that a solid is going to form around the zinc metal, okay? Or you could just say a reddish-brown solid forms if you want to, and that would be fine, okay? 
second observation is the solution. Uh, that this turns from blue to clear. which is a signal that the Cu2 plus ions are, are no longer in the solution or they're there in, in a much lower concentration, okay? The question, why does this reaction occur? I debated on whether to put that on this set of notes or not. Um, if you guys have your periodic tables that I gave you earlier in the year, you're going to notice that they have a big chart on the back of them called the standard reduction potentials in aqueous solution at 25 degrees Celsius. Okay, We are going to use this a lot in this unit, but we're really going to talk about it more in the next section. Okay, um, But the basic idea here is the reason that this reaction occurs, because if you think about what's happening here, essentially copper is stealing electrons from zinc. Can you guys see that? Because the zinc becomes more positive, so it must be losing electrons, right? The copper is gaining electrons. So there must be something inherent about the copper that wants electrons more than the zinc does, okay? And so we'll just, we'll leave it at that for now. Um, Cu wants electrons more than zinc, okay? Now again, I have to be careful with giving these these atoms personality okay it's not really that they want things it's um, there's a driving force here okay that causes it to be this way um, but essentially zinc is more willing to give up its electrons than the copper is okay and uh, maybe that has something to do with the fact that zinc has a full set of d orbitals so giving away its two s orbitals is going to result in a fairly stable arrangement okay because then it's just got a full set of d orbitals and an empty set of s orbitals in that outer energy level. Okay, um, but for whatever reason, we'll just leave it at this for now. Okay, that the copper wants the electrons more than the zinc, so that's why this reaction is going to occur spontaneously. Okay. Now, problem with doing the reaction this way is we just end up with a big mess. Okay, and we didn't really do anything. It's, I mean. It's kind of cool to watch. We put a zinc strip in and we make some copper. I guess you could use this if you're just trying to make copper. Okay. Um, but there's a better way to do this reaction so that we actually get some energy out of it. Because what's happening here is electrons are flowing, right? The electrons are moving from one thing to another thing. And that's electricity. So we should be able to use that to harness that. Okay. So what we do. Same reaction, but now it's taking place in two different beakers, and we're connecting it with some wires. Okay, and so what you can do here is you put a piece of zinc metal into a solution that contains zinc two plus, and then you put copper metal into a solution that contains copper two plus. You connect those with wires, so the electrons can travel through. So you're basically completing the circuit. Okay, but as the electrons pass through the wire, let's Let's have them do something, right? So right here, it's connected to a voltmeter, and you can see that the voltage on that is 1.10 volts. Okay. Um, if you connected a light bulb to that thing, if the reaction was strong enough, it would actually light the light bulb. Okay. So that's kind of a cool way to actually use this reaction in a in a little bit more useful way. Okay. And that's that's kind of the idea behind batteries. So. Um, is there anything else I want to say here? No, that's. I mean, that's. The external circuit thing is, is basically the main idea. So you've got a battery, right? Your typical battery is going to make connections with a circuit that's inside of whatever you're powering, okay? And so as the electrons flow through that, it's going to chemically react, okay? The electrons are going to flow, flow through, they're going to power whatever you're using and provide the needed electricity for it, okay? Kind of a cool idea. Now, eventually, obviously, batteries go bad. And maybe you can see the reason for that now. Eventually, the chemicals are going to stop reacting. Okay. All right. So <laughs> the electrode where the oxidation occurs. Now we just need to basically learn some terminology. And this is going to be a little bit rough. I'll try and give you some good ways to remember this terminology. But there are so many in this redox unit. There are just so many terms to remember and so many things to keep straight. There's like four or five steps you have to take from figuring out which one's losing electrons and figuring out that means, okay, that's oxidation. That means um, oxidation is going to be at the anode. And, you know, you, just, you have to keep going, keep going with this. But um, 
the electrode where oxidation occurs is called the anode. Now, I need to back up because I didn't talk about electrodes yet. Okay. Let's go back here. In this example, the two solid metals, those are called the electrodes. Okay. So in this case, the copper and the zinc, those are the electrodes. Okay. Those are just solid pieces of metal through which the current can be conducted. All right. So that's that's what an electrode is. It's basically just this solid piece that you've got inside your solution here. Okay. So the electrode where the oxidation occurs, that's called the anode. And then the electrode where the reduction occurs is called the cathode. Now, a couple of ways to remember this. Oxidation, anode, they both start with a vowel. Okay. And so that, that maybe would help you remember that the oxidation happens at the anode. Now, another thing here. You go two letters out, an ox. I don't know if that helps you or not. But it's an ox, okay? Not a ox, it's an ox. I don't know if that helps. Okay, so for this example, the anode is going to be what? Well, I'll tell you what. Let's write the oxidation half reaction first because we kind of know how to do that at this point, hopefully. Um, and then we can talk about the anode. So what is the oxidation that's occurring here? the actual reaction that we wrote here. Which thing is being oxidized? The zinc, right? So our oxidation half reaction here would be Zn solid going to Zn2 plus plus two electrons. Don't forget to write the electrons in on the half reactions. Okay. So that's our oxidation half reaction. The zinc is losing two electrons. All right. So the anode, the place where the oxidation is happening, would be on the zinc strip. Does that make sense? All right. The electrode where the reduction occurs is called the cathode. Um, those both, I, I messed that up. <laughs> I fixed it on your notes, didn't I? Six consonant on your notes. Okay, yeah, I, I forgot to fix it on here. Okay. Uh, reduction and cathode do not both start with a vowel, they both start with a consonant. Um, but another way that you can remember this red cat. Okay? So it doesn't make any sense to say and cat, right? So and goes with ox, red goes with cat. All right? And ox and red cat. So I don't know, again, maybe that helps, maybe it doesn't. Um, so the reduction half reaction is going to be the other one, right? That's the copper 2 plus, um, and I have to be careful here so that I have room, plus 2 electrons yields copper solid, okay? Again, the easiest part to forget on these half reactions is the, uh, the electrons, but if you write your half reaction and your charges aren't balanced, hopefully that'll tip you off. Oh yeah, I need to put the electrons somewhere to make sure the charges are balanced here, okay? So in this example, the cathode is going to be the the copper metal, okay? Or the, the copper copper two plus cell there, okay? All right. So each of the two compartments of the voltaic cell are called half cells. One is for oxidation and one is for reduction. Um, and as this happens, the zinc electrode is actually going to lose mass, and the copper electrode is going to gain mass. Now this is weird because we expect that to happen in something like this, right? Because the copper is, you know, it's plating out on the zinc and the zinc is going to get smaller. That just kind of makes sense. What, what you're going to see here, though, you're actually going to see this zinc strip just get smaller. Okay, nothing's going to form on it. It's just going to get smaller. And the copper, that strip is going to start to actually gain mass. Okay, it's going to get bigger. And it's just with more copper. So... The question is, why is that happening? And to answer that, we kind of have to go back to our half reactions we just wrote, right? Look what's happening to the zinc. It starts out as a solid, right? And then it actually dissolves, dissociates into the solution, okay? So it becomes zinc 2 plus. So that zinc strip is actually going to lose mass as this reaction proceeds. Uh, the copper 
it is going from a copper 2 plus ion to copper solid. Okay, so looking at this thing, the 2 plus ions that are floating around in this blue solution here, as the course of this reaction proceeds, the copper 2 plus is then going to gain electrons and then it's going to plate out as extra copper on the copper strip. Does that make sense? So let me think about how I want to write that. Um, zinc solid is being changed to zinc 2 plus resulting in a loss of mass. And then the copper 2 plus is being converted to Cu solid resulting in an increase in mass. Okay, so again, just kind of an understanding of what's happening in the solution. This is a reaction we're familiar with. We're just taking it and separating it into two components, and then we're connecting it with a wire. Okay. Everybody okay with what we've talked about so far? Okay. So, um, for this process to work, each of the half-cell solutions have to be electrically neutral. Okay. So, what we have to think about here, if we go back to our picture, I'm going to use this picture a lot. Okay. The electrons are essentially flowing in this... Let me erase this because this is going to get a little too complicated here if I don't... Um, the electrons are flowing from the zinc to the copper, right? Can we can we all see that? Okay. So they're flowing away from here, okay? And they're flowing into this solution. <coughs> I forgot the question. <laughs> uh, oh, why do they have to be electrically neutral? Okay. So if the electrons are flowing into this solution out of the other one, if that happens for very long, then this solution is going to start to become more negatively charged. Does that make sense? Because we've got extra electrons over here. This solution is going to become more positive. Okay. The bad thing about that is electrons don't like to flow into a negative solution. Okay, a solution that's negatively charged. So you let this go long enough, those electrons aren't going to want to travel across anymore. Okay, and it won't take very long for that to happen. So we have to somehow keep the two solutions electrically neutral, okay? And the best way to do that, well, okay, I guess I should answer the why here. Um, because the, here, let's use our new words. So I just said this solution is going to start to become more negative. Which side is that? The side where the reduction is occurring. That's the cathode, right? Because the cathode um, maybe I want to word that differently. I was trying to use our vocabulary, but sorry. Because the cell where reduction is occurring. will become negative um, which means electrons will not want to flow that direction that's not the best wording of that okay so basically, we need some way to, to do a transfer of positive and negative ions to keep the solutions neutral, right? And the way that that gets accomplished is with something called a salt bridge, okay? And so now we've got kind of a, this is our typical setup. This is the drawing that you're typically going to see on the AP exam. Um, nice and complicated, right? 
but it's not it's really not too bad I mean what we've got going on here we've got the zinc at the anode okay and remember the anode is where the oxidation is occurring so that's losing electrons okay so the electrons are going this direction through a switch which when opened it will complete the circuit so you can close the switch keep the electrons from flowing no reaction will occur okay you open the switch or maybe it's the other way around you know whichever and you know, other switches that are normally open switches that are normally closed but whichever way you have to do it in order to allow the current to flow through okay then the electrons can flow through we've got a voltmeter here you don't have to connect a voltmeter you can connect anything that you want to power to that right so a light bulb you know whatever um, the electrons are then going to flow into the cathode, okay? And then you've got this thing right here, this salt bridge in the middle, and it's connected to both of the solutions, okay? And this is basically just the way of completing the circuit, okay? So what we're talking about here, this is the solution that's going to start to become more negative, right? And so notice there are sodium ions in this salt bridge, and those sodium ions are free to flow into this solution to neutralize it. Okay? And sodium is okay because it's not going to react with anything anyway. I mean, we know sodium does nothing. It has done nothing all year in this class, all right? So no exception here. Sodium basically just flows into here, and it's going to keep this solution neutral. And then the nitrate is going to flow into this solution, which is slowly becoming more positive, and keep it neutral. Okay, so that way there's no positive negative solution here. They stay neutral and uh, and then the reaction can continue. Okay? Does that make sense? Okay. Um, so essentially that's that's completing the circuit. Okay, if you want to think about it that way. Um, it's sort of like the electrons are flowing through this solution and they flow back up through here into this solution and now we're now we're good again. Okay. So you've just got this constant flow going this way and then coming back through, going this way, coming back through, just like a typical circuit will do. Okay. All right. Um, anything else I need to say about the salt bridges? Now, salt bridges can be very, um, very complicated like this. They can actually be very, very simple. Um, in the lab that we do, we're going to take a piece of cloth and we're going to lay it between our two cells and that basically allows ions to travel through and so you're good there okay so it doesn't have to be really complicated this is the typical setup though um, the anions are always going to flow toward the anode okay and we just basically said that okay the NO3 minus anions in this example are going to flow into the anode because the anode is slowly becoming it would become more positive if we let it okay and then the cations are going to flow towards the cathode Okay, the, the Na plus is then going to come into the cathode because that's the one where the electrons are going. That's the one that would become more negative, again, if we let it. Okay, now, I want to point something out here that's sort of unrelated to the salt bridge. I'm not sure why I put this bullet here. It probably should be out a little more. Um, there's a positive and a negative sign on the cathode and the anode. And I just want to point out that does not that's not telling you what the charge on the cathode and the anode are. Okay? there shouldn't be a charge on the cathode and the anode all right because they're just solid pieces of metal so what this means is that the negative sign and I wish they had figured out some other way to to show this okay I don't know why they have to use a negative and a positive but this is the convention the negative sign on the electrode just means that that's where the electrons are coming from okay the positive side or the positive sign on the cathode just means that's where the electrons are traveling to okay you're going away from the negative side towards the positive so just, you know, when you see this negative and positive on the cathode and the anode, don't, don't let it throw you. That's just showing the direction of travel of the electrons. Okay? All right. Um, that's it for that. In any voltaic cell, electrons are going to flow from the anode to the cathode. You don't necessarily have to remember that, though, or memorize that, as long as you remember anox and red cat, right? And as long as you know what oxidation and reduction mean. And for that, you need to remember Leo's goes Ger. Leo goes Ger, not Leo's. There's not more than one of them. Um, so there's a lot of kind of acronyms there to remind you of all this stuff. But um, if they're asking about the anode, then your thought process should be, okay, anox, so that's oxidation that's occurring. And oxidation, that's Leo, so that's lose electrons oxidation, right? 
So the electrons are flowing away from the anode because that's the one that's losing the electrons. They're flowing to the cathode. Okay, red cat, that's reduction. Reduction is GER, or gain electrons, so that's the one that's gaining electrons. You see how that works? Okay, it's kind of a long thought process, but that's that's it. Um, all right, so following oxidation reduction reaction is spontaneous. And this is, there's a lot here, so I had to really shrink it down so I'd have room to write on, on my screen. Hopefully you can read that on your notes. Um, we've got a solution that contains potassium chromate and... Uh, H2SO4, that's in one beaker. And then we've got a solution of Ki poured into another beaker. Hmm. Kind of interesting, why do we have to put acid into the one? Any ideas? Well, here, let's write the half reactions and then maybe we can figure it out, okay? Because one of the things that it's telling us to do here is the first thing that's really telling us to do after a bunch of information is indicate the reaction occurring at the anode, the reaction at the cathode. All right? So the reaction at the anode is going to be what? Oxidation, right? Okay. So that's the oxidation reaction. Um, not that we necessarily have to know that up front. I'll tell you what. We'll do this the way we did it yesterday, where we don't necessarily know at the beginning and we can figure out based on where the electrons end up, okay? So, one of the half reactions that's occurring here, I'm going to guess, is the Cr2O7 going to Cr3+, plus. okay? That kind of looks like one of our half reactions, can we agree on that? And then what's probably the other half reaction that's occurring here? The I- minus going to I2, right? Everything else in that reaction, the H plus and the H2O, that looks like that comes about as a result of us balancing the redox equation. Okay, so we've got our Cr2, O7, 2 minus going to uh, 2 Cr3 plus. Okay, now what else do we have to do to balance this equation? And actually, this has already been done for us. I'm just kind of running us back through the the whole process here, just for a good reminder. We've got seven oxygens on the left side and none on the right side, so how do we fix that? We add 7H2O, right? Which you should see in the equation up here, there are 7H2O on the right side, so that makes sense. And then, because we just now added 14 uh, hydrogens to this equation, now we have to put 14 H pluses on this side, right? Now, could this half reaction have occurred if we did not have uh, H2SO4 in that solution? No, because there would be no H+, right? You see how that works? That's why in the K2Cr207 solution, we also needed the H2SO4. We need some sort of acid there that's going to give us the H+, that we need. Okay. So that's why they give you that little piece of information. Um, but now our charges are not balanced, right? We've got a 12 plus charge overall on this side, and we've got a uh, what on this side? Careful here. Six plus, right? Because there are two of the Cr3 minus or three pluses. So we need six electrons on this side. Did not save myself too much. Room. Okay, six electrons on that side. So that's one half reaction. Now, which half reaction is that? Because we need to label it now. Okay, it's gaining electrons, right? Because the, re the electrons are on the reactant side, so they're reacting with this to make the Cr3+. Plus, okay, so the chromium's being reduced here. So if it's a reduction, then this is happening at the... the cathode, red cat, right? So this is the half reaction at the cathode. So then the other one is probably going to be at the anode. It's definitely going to be at the anode. So the other reaction is actually really easy also. It's I minus goes to I2. Okay, and the reason that we have a 6 and a 3 in front of there is because um, if we look at this thing, um, well, first of all, you've got to put a 2 in front of here to balance your iodines, right? That's the only thing you have to do to balance that reaction. But we're going to have two electrons on this side. Since there's 6 up here, we have to multiply this bottom equation by 3. Does that make sense? OK, 
Okay, so then we're gonna end up with 6i minus plus 3i2 gives us six electrons. Okay, and that's the reaction that's happening at the anode. Okay, now, the next thing is the direction of electron and ion migrations and the signs of the electrodes. This is where I'm going to try to draw a little bit. Um, and this may or may not go well. So I'm going to erase this. Hopefully you guys have a little bit of room here. Um, okay, let me remember, first of all, so the cathode is the chromate, or the dichromate, and the anode is going to be the iodine. Okay, so I'm going to draw something that is, you know, hopefully looks a little bit like what has been on the drawings on the other slides. It's not going to be nearly as good. Um, but in one of these solutions, and it doesn't matter where you put it, okay, um, let's, let's stay with the way they were doing it. They put the anode on the left side. Okay, again, it doesn't really matter. You just have to pay attention to which one is the anode and which one is the cathode. So... We'll call this one the anode over here, okay? And we just said the anode is going to be the um, the one with the Ki in it. Is that right? Okay, because this has there's going to be I minus in this solution. Okay. Why did I just do that? <laughs> I put it in the opposite one of the one that I had just labeled. Sorry. There's going to be I minus in this solution, the anode. And then the cathode's going to be over here. And the cathode is going to be the Cr2O7. 2 minus, and then we've also got some H plus floating around in there that helps that thing to occur. All right, and there's obviously there's water in both of these. These are both solutions. Okay. So then we're also going to have electrodes here. Okay. Now, does it specify what our electrodes are made of? It just says a metallic conductor that will not react with either solution, such as platinum foil. Okay. So we've got. Let's just say we've got pieces of platinum foil in here. Okay. And that's not going to react with either of the solutions, okay? And they're conduct or they're connected with wires through a voltmeter or some other device to conduct a current. Okay. So here's our voltmeter. Okay. So what they want us to um to label here is they want us to label the direction of the electron and ion migrations. Okay, now where are the ions? Where does that come into play? Well, okay, so we're we're talking about electron flow through the wires, right? But the ion flow happens through what? Where are the ions in this one flowing? It's through the salt bridge, right? Okay. So when they ask about the ion flow, the ion migrations, they're talking about the salt bridge. So again, this is just getting ugly, but I'm doing the best I can here. There's our salt bridge, okay, which dips into both the solutions. So all they want to know here is which direction are the electrons traveling at this point. From the I minus to the Cr207 to minus, do we agree with that? From the anode to the cathode, right? Because the anode is where oxidation occurs, and oxidation is the loss of electrons. The electrons are going this way. Okay, so there's the direction of our electron migrations. We've got that one. Now the ion migrations. Let's think about this. If the electrons are going this direction, then the anode is the solution that's going to tend to want to become positive, right? Because it's losing electrons. So the negative ions... This is horrible. ...are going to be flowing this way, okay? And then the positive ions are going to be flowing into this solution. And that will maintain neutrality in the, in the two beakers, okay? So we've got the ion migrations, and then the signs of the electrodes, okay? Remember, I said that the direction the electrons are coming from, that's labeled with the negative, and the side that the electrons are going to is labeled with the positive, right? So the platinum electrode over here would be the one that's labeled as a negative, 
and then the platinum electrode over here would be labeled as positive. Okay, Does that makes sense. There's a lot here. I, there's just a lot of terminology. The thing that I probably like least is the the signs on the electrodes. I don't know. I just don't know why that's necessary. Okay, so very quickly, and then we're we're just about done here. Um, showing you a more molecular view of what's going on in the zinc and the copper reaction. And we've already sort of talked about this, so I'm going to go through this fairly quickly. But there is a little bit of a blow up here at the bottom uh, picture showing exactly what's happening to the zinc strip, okay? Um, and to the copper, okay? So in this, um, and this is where, where the, the two things are directly in contact. So this is kind of like a before and an after picture up at the top here, okay? So what's happening um, to the zinc itself, the zinc is losing electrons, right? And those electrons are going into the solution, okay? And then what's happening is, you can see here, as the copper then gains electrons, it's going to turn into copper solid and it's going to start to plate out on the metal itself, okay? Hopefully that makes sense. I think it probably made sense before I showed that to you. This might be overkill. Um, and then if we're talking about the voltaic cell, okay, similar process occurring, it's just separated into two different parts, all right? So in this one, you've got your zinc, and in the anode, uh, the oxidation is occurring, all right? So instead of the electrons um, going out into the solution where the copper is, the electrons actually go up through the wire, okay? So you can see the electrons, they're moving up through the metal itself, okay? because metals are good at this, letting electrons sort of move through them, okay? And then it's going to, the electrons are going to go into the copper, okay? And as they go into the copper, then they're going to enter this solution where the copper 2 plus is, and the copper 2 plus ions are going to then gain those electrons, and then it's going to turn into extra copper, okay? Extra solid copper, I should say. And again, this only works with the salt bridge, Okay, so on this one, instead of having a salt bridge, they just have a porous barrier there that the, the ions can flow through either way. All right, so that's that. Hopefully that makes sense. That's your introduction to voltaic cells. We're going to be doing a lot more work with those in the next few days.